this is true. We believe it, and we believe it. We're living for you. We're living for you. We're living for you. Let's see how I'm going to be. Who I'm going to be. Oh, if it's going to be bigger in this land. Be a speaker of truth. I want to stand. I want to run into your run. Into your run. I'm going to be, and I'm going to be a historian maker in this land. I want to be Lord. And I'm gonna run into your arms. I will run. Oh, I'm gonna run into your arms. Into your arms. Into your arms. Into your arms. We're gonna run. Always for you. We're gonna run. We're gonna run and not go weary. We're gonna walk and not go faint. We're gonna run and not go weary. We're gonna walk and not grow faint. Let's do that again. We're gonna run and not grow weary. We're gonna walk and not grow faint. We're gonna run and not grow weary. We're gonna walk and not grow faint. Yeah. We're gonna run and not grow weary. We're gonna walk and not grow faint. We're gonna run and not grow weary. We're gonna run, oh, it won't be faint, and I'm gonna be a story maker in this land. I'm gonna be, let's do this. I'm gonna stand, and I'm gonna run into your arms. children with a godly love. We're going to love our children with your love, Father.
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, this is how we overcome. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. The team from Pascagoula has a man that plays bass way up here. And when he's, when he's singing that, he's going, uh, how's it he goes, Molly? You fell in love with that guy while he was playing. Do, tell, do it like you would do it. You won't do it? Oh, I remember now, I remember now, he, he'd say, this is how we overcome, and he'd be back there going, Overcomers in the land, overcomers in the land. And he'd do something in between everyone. You know, we're overcomers. You know, I believe we all needed this. How many of you children's leaders and children's workers very seldom ever get a chance to find yourself in church to be in fed? Has God been the feeder this week? Amen. Amen. You guys want to do one more? I stopped you, but I don't... I, would you pull his nose out of there? Oh, I thought you were stuck there for a minute. I was worried about you there for a second. I thought it's, you were stuck. It's kind of hard to talk to that thing, you know? I was afraid you so? would go, you know, it came off. Um, I don't think they're right ready to quit. Right? I, was, I was stopping things to turn it over to John, but John, you may have to wait a few more minutes. Yeah. Wherever he is. <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> He's like, gee, he may have left already. <laughs> but um, they want to do one more. I don't know. You you one more? Yeah. Okay. You got any ideas of what it might be fun to do? You think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> By the way, I want to tell you guys something. A lot of people this about Chris, and you, and, and you may not understand this about your ministry as you start turning things over to children, young people now, they grow up. Um, when Chris walks up here, he does not have a list of songs. I don't know if you've ever noticed, most worship leaders have this set list, and they got that, 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 that. These guys never know where he's going, and I never tell him where to go unless I feel that there's something particular that I want him to do. And uh, so if you wonder why sometimes we don't get words up, we don't have any idea where he's going, and many times we probably got a hundred songs up there on that computer, James, right? <laughs> and uh, at one point this week, he sang three songs that we didn't even have words for, and we got a hundred, so uh, we never know where the boy's going. You know why? Because he doesn't either, you know? <laughs> Hallelujah! It is so much fun to be free in the Holy Ghost. There's no pressure, there's no planning, just let the Holy Ghost be him. Ready? Y'all ready? Okay, let's do some more. 
I will dance, I will sing to be mad for my king. Nothing, Lord, is hindering the passion in my soul. I will dance, I will sing to be mad for my king. Nothing, Lord, is hindering the passion in my soul, and I'll become even more dignified than this. Some would say it's foolishness, but I'll become even more dignified than this. Come on, let's play now, guys. Now I will dance, I will sing to be mad for my king. Nothing, Lord, is hindering the passion in my soul. I will dance, I will sing to be mad for my king. Nothing, Lord, is hindering the passion in my soul, and I'll become even more undignified than this. Some would say it's foolishness, but I'll become even more undignified than this. I'll lay my pride by the side and I'll become even more dignified than this. Some would say it's foolishness, but I'll become even more dignified than this. Oh, listen now. And we sing na 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 Now, 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 let's go to the fight! Yeah. Oh, and I will dance, I will sing to be mad for my king. Nothing, Lord, is hindering the passion in my soul. I will dance, I will sing to be mad for my king. Nothing, Lord, is hindering. Passion in my soul, and I'll become even more dignified than this. Some would say it's foolishness, but I'll become even more dignified than this. I'll lay my pride by the side, and I'll become even more dignified than this. Some would say it's foolishness, but I'll become more dignified than this. Oh, come on, let's do it again! It was sing na 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 Even more dignified than this. Some would say it's foolishness, but I'll become even more dignified than this. Oh, I'll lay my pride by the side, and I'll become even more dignified than this. Some would say it's foolishness, but I'll become even more dignified than this. It's all for you, my Lord. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Woo. Give the Lord praise this morning. Yeah. Amen. What does more undignified than this look like? The big Gatto song, but you may have a seat. He just asked me how long did he have, and I said, as long as you need, but then I wanted to look around and find out where she sure was. <laughs> if she's here, I'm putting the tin man on. <laughs> um, uh, you're supposed to have an hour. Okay. So wherever some in there, uh, we, may, that's great. We, may miss, we may be short on break or something. That's, that's okay. That's good. Turn to John chapter 8. No, make it Mark chapter 8. Pastor Van was just talking about uh, the missions trips that we take. If you'd like more information, my missions director, Michael Watson, will be in the back table right after we get finished. We'll get you a brochure, a missions brochure. We just got back from uh, a team from uh, Ireland, went into almost 20 different Catholic schools. The first time in the history of the nation that's been done, folks. 
When we went there a year and a half ago, we were able to get into 11 Catholic schools. Um, we went on Holy Week. They asked us what we were going to teach the children. No, they asked us what we were going to teach their children. And I said, we were going to teach them about Jesus. Oh, really? Well, Holy Week is their most sacred week of the year. Oh, please tell them about Jesus. So we go in there, and we went in there. Our theme that week was God is a good God. Well, you wouldn't believe the faces of the kids when we say, when we sang, God is a good God. Yes, he is. He is? God is good? Because they're taught over there that God is not good because they're living in war 24 hours a day. And they're, it's blamed on God. God's really good, and Jesus is alive? Yeah, he's no longer on that cross, boys and girls. Really? Well, I tell you what, we had revival in those schools. They invited us back. So we took another team back just a few weeks ago. I tell you what, folks, things are happening all over the world. All over the world. We take teams of children, uh, teenagers and adults. And if you'd like one of our newsletters, this is the latest newsletters that, that uh, we've put out. It's got... Uh, the trips that we took in Mexico. We took 100 people to Mexico. We had so many people that we had to split up our team. We took, how many, Karen to Ensenada? What was it, 35, something like that? And then we took the rest of the team to south of Juarez, Mexico. And uh, if you like one of these newsletters, they're free. We have a summer intern program. Where's Rodney and Monica? There you are. Your son, Kyle, came to our program. We had 21 interns, ages 13 through 20, that spent an entire month with us in North Carolina. Oh, I said that word, didn't I? Well, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I am, I am going to give out, I am going to give out some t-shirts and, and some things during my time, okay? So you just kind of remind me every once in a while like this, and that'll, that'll say, North Carolina, you got it, okay? So if you like one of these, we've got six missions trips scheduled for the year 2001. If you'd like to hook up with one of, uh, one of our uh, teams, if you'd like to hook up with one of us, please let us know, and we can get you more information. We, we give you the information. We give you the training. Matter of fact, one of the things that we have, a year and a half ago, Charisma Life called us, and they said, we understand. We've been hearing that you've been taking kids all over the world. Would you write a curriculum? We'll produce it for you. So we did. They've produced it. It is the best curriculum on missions that you could get. You know, when you and I were kids, uh, the way that I was taught, at least, about missionaries around the world, they would have a little piggy bank. Well, boys and girls, next Sunday is going to be Mission Sunday. Bring in your pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. Well, that was as far as I got. And I remember thinking about Africa, the dark cotton that God never sent me to Africa. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go, but never send me to Africa. <laughs> we've, we've been there a number of different times. It's wonderful, and we're going back again. But this gives kids more than just an awareness of missions. It gets them outside their four walls. Hello. It gets them outside their four walls. There's five lessons in it. Does it take you five weeks, or you could spend a whole year on it. Um, Victory in the Wilderness, I want to give this book out to someone here today when I say those two words. How many have ever gone through the wilderness? Some of you are going through the wilderness right now. Well, when you're going through the wilderness, it seems like, my God, where are you? Hello? Well, that's not the case. See, the wilderness experience is the time that God is develop developing character in every one of us. Victory in the Wilderness by John Bevere is an absolutely awesome book. I'm going to give this out when I say North Carolina. So, <laughs> young fellow right up here. Thank you. Final quest, Rick Joyner. Uh, you've got to read this book. How many have ever read this book? How many have not read this book. You need to get your hands on this. I'm going to give this one out too. I'm going to put it right up right here so I remember to say those words, North Dakota. So, uh, sorry, sweetheart. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have exactly 14 minutes, 14 hours and two minutes to make this day better than yesterday. Let's begin. Now, yesterday was great. I mean, yesterday was great. But we're not going to live in yesterday. We're not going to live in yesterday's manna. Hello. 
My Bible says his mercies are new every morning. They're new every day. That means they're new. They're not the same mercies that I had yesterday. They are new mercies. His faithfulness to me, it's brand new. That means he's never running out of ideas for me. Why is that so? Why do we have to have new mercies every day? Because we're changing people. We're going from glory to glory. We're not the same people that we were a week ago. I trust you are not the same person today than when you came Wednesday afternoon. The light of God's glorious gospel is getting brighter and brighter and brighter. So why don't we begin right now to make this day better than yesterday? You see, it just doesn't happen. Having the best day of your life just doesn't happen. You have got to make it happen. You've got to be hungry and desperate for more of God. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse, study with verse 22. And he cometh to Bethsaida, Jesus, and they brought a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, he put his... Now, notice, and I, I've, done some, I've done some studying on this. He put spit. He put spit on his eyes. It wasn't one of these things. The man's eyelids were closed, and he spit on his eyelids. He put spit on his eyes. How many have ever seen a blind man? It seems like there is a film over their eyes. And he put anointed spit on those eyes. And I can imagine the man going like this. What do you think he would see? Well, what that spit, anointed spit was doing, it was dissolving the glaze that was over his eyes. And he's going like this, and Jesus says, what is it that you see? And he looked around, and he says, I see men as trees walking. And Jesus, I can picture him, like when you have something in your eye, or in the morning you have to go like this, you have to rub your eyes again and kind of, Kind of, kind of get things moving on the inside there. And all of a sudden, Jesus, now what do you see? He says, I see men. I see men. I see men. I can see clearly now. Wow. It goes on to say, in verse 26, and Jesus sent him back home. Let's go back to verse 23. And Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. As I was studying this, I thought, this is very interesting. And Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. And Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. Sometimes we need to get out of town in order to get our touch from God. Hello, I know it's early in the morning, but you better get this. You know what Jesus has done for you? And no, do you know why you are here? Because Jesus took you by the hand. Can I have your hand, please? Jesus took you by the hand and he led you out of town so you could get a touch from God. Because I believe most of you would have never received a touch of God in your town. That's why these conferences are so important. And let me go a step further. Some of you have come to this conference during worship time last night. Man, I was just writing down what the Spirit of God was giving me. 
Some of you have come to this conference weary, tired, frustrated, and you're ready to give it up. Some of you are not ready to give it up, but you are totally exasperated. You've had it up to here with things, rules, regulation, people, paperwork. It's not so much the kids. It's the stuff, the other stuff. Man, if it wasn't for the people, man, the ministry would be great. <laughs> See, some of you have come to this place totally exhausted. And it has been God, your heavenly Father, that has taken you by the hand and he has had to literally take you and get you out of town for you to get your touch from God. And one of the reasons why you are so frustrated and exhausted and flustered is because there's a tendency for us as children's pastors and leaders you ready for this? To, to get our self-worth and our self-esteem based on what we do. We get our self-worth and our self-esteem by performance. So what we end up doing every day of our lives is perform, perform, perform. We perform. We do. We're busy. We're doing this and we're doing that. The pastor says, I want this. You say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And don't get me wrong. That's why you're there. You're working and you're flowing in the vision of the pastor. But we become so performance orientated, we become frustrated. Because the work begins, just continues to mount and mount and mount. If it's not the volunteers, it's the kids. If it's not the kids, it's trying to get money to get a sound system or get another chair or get another puppet. How many have been there before? But see, most of our self-esteem is based on what we do. And the more we do the better we feel about ourselves. It's a trap of the enemy. Now, I don't, I'm not quite sure where I'm going with it this morning. But see, you can leave this place tomorrow or Sunday, go back to your church, and get caught in the trap of busyness all over again. Just performing. You know, I've got a Christmas program I've got to do. Oh, my God. And then we've got kids. We've got Halloween. We've got the kids' fun fest. Oh, it's right around the corner. Oh, my God. And then we've got Thanksgiving. And then we've got the holidays. Hey, if you're anything like me, I know, I know for years it was, my God, I hate the winter season. I hate Christmas time. I mean, it seems like every night of... Every night of December, there is always something to do. We've got a children's program over here, and then we've got the adult program. Then we've got the teenagers doing their thing, and then we've got banquets, Christmas banquets we've got to attend. And by Christmas time, you're pulling out whatever, well, you, you know what I mean. <laughs> My God, help! We're so busy, busy, busy. God has not called you to be busy. He has called you to be fruitful. And if what you are doing is just a bunch of busy, 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 busy work, and you see no fruit, you better, ch you better check and see what you're doing. And why don't you all learn how to say, say this, repeat after me, no. Did that sound, did that, was it? Did that feel good or did it feel funny? <laughs> Listen, when you get so busy, 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 you become more of a human doing than you are a human being. 
You're just doing, 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 doing. And you know what happens? Pretty soon, your family will suffer. Your children will suffer. Hello, we've been there. Pretty soon, your children, if you continue going down the road you've been going down, where you're just so busy, 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 and your work performance orientated, your kids are going to look at mommy and daddy, and they're going to say, listen, if this is what the ministry is all about, I don't want it. You can preach it in church, but you can't preach it at home. You can live it at church, but you can't live it at home. Something's got to change. And when your wife says to you, husbands, hello, then they're also, you're married to the ministry. Ah, what a slap in the face. I'll never forget when my wife said, you're married to the ministry. How dare she say something like that? Well, then I started checking my own life. You see, when I can't spend time in the morning praying with my wife because I've got people to see and places to go and things to do, you know, and I'm a big fish in a small pond, you know, and people are depending on me. When you can't spend time in the morning sitting down with your wife and praying and reading, Sir, something's wrong. Oh, man. We're getting quiet in here. I didn't really expect to go this route, but I've got to. I've got to. He's, he's taking the armor of God that he may be able to stand against the... Uh, It's a good thing Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are between you guys, huh? <laughs> are you hearing what I'm saying? You see, you're not going to work for it. You're going to worship for it. See, I, w I was so busy, busy, busy doing the work of the ministry. I was doing good things, folks, but I was caught in a trap. For years, I was caught in a trap. I mean, I was caught in this cycle. This, this, the ministry was growing, but I was, I had a shrinking anointing. And I was trying to keep it going and trying to keep it going and trying to keep it going in the flesh. See, anything that you start in the flesh must be maintained in the flesh. Write it down. Anything you start in the flesh is going to have to be maintained. But my Bible says the works of the flesh are wood, hay, and stubble, and they won't amount to a thing. Israel, Ishmael ministries are born of a need and birthed by the flesh. But Isaac ministries are born of a call and birthed by the Spirit. Isaac ministries are born of a call. See, you're not doing what you're doing, ladies and gentlemen, because of this great burden that you have for children. You better not be doing what you're doing because of a great burden, but you're doing it because of a call. You have a call of God on you, and it's more than just a dream. It is a call. But what you've got to do, if you've got to set your priorities, this is what I'm going to do first thing in the morning. Nothing becomes, comes between. Would you just lift up your hands right now? Because I just, I, I just feel something's just, God's doing something right now by the Spirit of God. Some of you just want to just, just release it right now. Some of you are just, I mean, you're at the point, you're at the brink of just letting rivers, tears, just because of the love that you have on the inside for children, but you are totally frustrated. And this conference has been a turning point for your life. But you've got to hear from God, sir. 
You've got to hear from God, man, as to what your next step is. Because we've been giving birth to too many Ishmaels and trying to maintain and keep Ishmaels alive in the flesh where God is saying, I haven't called you to give birth to Ishmaels. I have called you to give birth to Isaacs. My promise. And you don't keep an Isaac going in the flesh. You keep it going in the spirit. There has got to be a change take place. You see, we're about ready to go into a new season of our life. Things are going to be real different from this point on. God, by his spirit, let the spirit of the living God fall fresh on us right now. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us right now. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us right now. Father, we're tired of doing it in the flesh. We're tired of doing it on our own. We're tired of, oh God, this frustration day after day, mounting and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Father, we release the care of it onto you. Just put, push it. Push it. Come on. Push, push, push. Roll the care of it onto. Push. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm saying to you, push. I say, push. I say to you, sir, push it away. Get it off of your shoulders. Just take it right off. Take it right off. Take it right off. For the weapons of your warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly, but they are mighty, mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that would try to exalt itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into captivity. Every thought, every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. His burden, his burden. Oh yeah, the fight that you have to fight is not in the flesh. The fight that you and I have to fight, fight, ladies and gentlemen, is by the Spirit. Yes, you will have to push. You will have to do some things. There's going to be labor, but it's not going to be a labor in the flesh. It's going to be a labor in the Spirit. And there's a difference. How do you tell the difference between a labor in the flesh and a labor in the Spirit? A labor in the flesh, you, you end up like this. You end up totally, totally exhausted, exasperated, weary, tired. Oh, are you getting this? My God, my God, my God. Jesus said to the devil when he was tempted, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, he said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou. What's the next word? Serve. Notice in that verse, service to God or service to man only comes after our worship to our Heavenly Father. What comes first? Worship. 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 Worship comes first before you perform. Worship comes first before you do. We're so busy, busy, busy. I can't emphasize it enough. We get so busy. We're busy doing good things, ladies and gentlemen. But it's all flesh if we're not doing it by the Spirit. My God, how do you get more time? How do I prioritize all the things that I've got to do? I'm going to tell you something. I don't know how God does it. I don't know how God takes and, and multiplies. I mean, if you've got two apples and you get rid of one apple, you, you're left with one apple, aren't you? Well, my Bible says if you have two apples and you give one away, you don't have less, you have more. 
I have no idea how God in the heavenly multiplies, but he multiplies it to us. When we, ladies and gentlemen, put God first in our life, at the very beginning of our day, he will multiply, he will stretch and fit in everything that we need to do perfectly and in order. It just happens. It just happens. And see, you'll never be able to explain what you haven't explored. You see, us here in this building, I think Pastor Van mentioned it the other day, yesterday. I mean, we can't take our kids somewhere where we haven't been. And then when we get up behind the pulpit and we begin to minister, that spirit that is in us comes out. So, you know, our kids are just as busy as us. We see the buzz, 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 the buzzing, 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 the buzzing. Buzz. How many know what I'm talking about? God, give your people rest. Let us labor. Huh. Let us labor to enter into that rest. See, we will never be able to enter into the rest of God until we get in the rest of God. See, it's, it's not over here where we've been serving and striving and working so hard. It's not, in, it's not necessarily, listen to this, it's not necessarily going to new levels. For us, I think what we need to do is go to a whole new dimension, a place where we've never been before, and in that dimension, there will be new levels, okay? It's like a graph. This is how I see it. You know, you know you're right here right now, and you're going to grow up into things of the Spirit, and you're going to see increase, and you're going to see this graph go up. But you know, you will have your down days. You will have your Sundays where you will walk away and say, my God, it'll be down here. But you know, this down day isn't as bad as, it's not as down as this down over here was. And then you'll have your up days. And then, you know, when you have those up days, pretty soon there will be a, a down time. But this down time isn't going to be as low as this down time. You see, those down times are times for us, I believe, that are given by God for us to come back and look in retrospect at what we're doing. And say, is what we are doing profiting the kingdom of God? I mean, we look out, 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 out the doors, especially those that live up north, and you see the trees changing colors. The leaves are changing colors. Do you know those leaves on those trees do not fall off? They are pushed off. The tree pushes those leaves off. That's why if you were to cut down a tree that had leaves on it, the, trees were, the leaves would die, but the leaves would what? Remain on the tree. The leaves would remain on that dead tree. Leaves literally are pushed off the tree to give that tree time to be rejuvenated during the next couple months, that it can bear more fruit. How many want more fruit? More fruit. Are you, seeing, are you, really, seeing an, are you really seeing enough fruit? Are you satisfied with where you are? Not me. Are you? Uh, more fruit. More fruit, God. I've got to see more fruit. But you know, this thing isn't, you just, I, I just can't lay hands on you and say, it's, it's going to work out from this day on. Everything's going to be prioritized. You know, you can't cast out flesh. Flesh thinks. I mean, it stinks. You know what God has been doing in the past couple of days? Mark made a comment on the way back when we went back to the room last night. We took him. And he says, he was laughing in the back seat, and he says, this is funny. He says, these people paid, what did he say, 80, would, would, you, would you all pay for the registration? 
Yeah, these people paid $80 to be beat up. <laughs> I says, yeah, get paid $80 to get beat up, but it feels good. Because what we're doing, man, what God is doing, he's turning us upside down, shaking all the junk. And there's still some there, and he continues to shake it up. And meanwhile, don't you feel like you're upside down? I mean, the past couple of days, is my, like, my, it feels good. It feels good, but you say, my God, how much more of this can I take? He turns you upside down, and he continues to shake you. Why? Because there's still flesh. See, what God has to do, he's got to peel layers of flesh off of us. Because what's underneath that flesh is spirit. Oh, yeah. I get people that say to me, oh, Brother John, how can, you, how can you stand working with kids? How in the world can you take kids all over the world? I can't even take my kids to Walmart. <laughs> you, you, you know, you get, you, 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 know, you get those people. How many have ever had those people like this? Yeah, home. Oh, I... Boy, praise God, you're doing it. Praise God, God has called you to minister to the children. I certainly can't do it. They drive me up the wall. How many have ever heard that before? Well, you know, I remember this one mom. She dropped off her boy. She literally threw both of her boys down the stairs of the Maybe Center in, 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 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I mean, literally, one was seven, one was nine. I mean, she says, here, I was down at the bottom of the stairs. I greet all the kids, every one of them, as they come into the children's church. And, you know, she says, here, Pastor John, see what you can do with them. And threw them downstairs. I met the mom after the service. I thought she would be sweet. She just got finished mis mi listening to a two-and-a-half-hour message. You'd think she'd be changed. No, come on. I said, wait, 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 wait. I, I refused to let those boys go back home in that atmosphere. I refused. I said, Mom, what seems to be your problem? Wait, listen, you don't live with my kids. They drive me up the wall. They make me so nervous. Oh, they make me angry. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I had a ball, a basketball, and that ball had no air in it, and I took some air, and I applied some pressure, air pressure, into that ball, so it became big and round, and I started bouncing that ball around five minutes later, all of a sudden, the pressure in the ball is gone. Did the, the pressure that I applied into the basketball, did it cause the weakness, or did it reveal the, weak, the weakness? Some of you know where I'm going. I'm going to go there anyway. You see, the pressure that I applied into that ball did not cause the weakness. The pressure that I applied into that ball revealed the weakness that was already there. Children do not cause you to be angry. Children do not cause you to be upset. They reveal a weakness that you already have. Hello. I said, hello. hello. Now, I'm not getting as many hellos or amens and, yeah, preach it like I did the other night. I what? This isn't a nice one. <clears throat> Everyone take your hands like this. Okay. Shake me, God. Get the flesh out. Get the junk out. Come on, more. Come on, shake. Shake me, God. Shake me. You know, see, when there's too many people, you know, they just get a stirring. I hope you didn't come to this conference to get a stirring. You know what happens to people that come to church on Sunday morning to get a stirring? They'll come next Sunday to get a stirring. And then they'll come next Sunday to get a stirring. And then they'll go to this conference and then it'll get a little stirring. How many men know that you can stir concrete just so long until it becomes hard? And we got a bunch of hard-hearted people in our churches because they come just to get stirred. You better not have come here, Toby, to get stirred, brother. Get up here. Get up here. Put those books down. Get up here. See what my brother needs? He needs a shaking. He needs a shaking. He needs someone to turn him upside down and 
Yes, yeah! No! Oh! See, he doesn't need a stirring. You know what he needs is a change. Amen. Thank you, Toby. See, what he doesn't, what we don't need is a bunch of stirred up people. Because a bunch of stirred up people, pretty soon they're going to be hard. Hard. Well, I've been here before. Well, Pastor, I heard that message before. You know, he taught on faith just three months ago. He's teaching on faith again. Well, how many times you go home, turn on your favorite, you, you turn on your favorite song and listen to it a zillion times. But you can't hear a message two or three times because you know what it's doing? It's shaking you up. Come on, shake, shake, come on. Shake me up, God. Now, I, no, this is what you're doing. I want you to picture yourself being turned down, upside down like this. Where all the junk is coming out. I mean, just, my God, take us by the ankles, turn us upside down and... See, it doesn't come by, oh God, I cast out the flesh. No. Flesh is only cast out through repentance. That's the only way. Who, oh, if I can just get brother so-and-so to lay hands on me, I know I'll get over this. No, you won't. You've tried it a zillion times before. What do you think you're going to, one more time is going to do it? People, see what people need? They know what they want, brother. They want one of those drive-through breakthroughs. Yeah, they like we drive up to McDonald's. I'll take a, uh, uh, or a Burger King. What's it, Big Mac? Big Mac? Big Mac. I'll take a, I'll take a Burger King, okay. I, I'll take one of those Whoppers. Oh, why, why don't you supersize it? Is that what you call it, supersize? Yeah, something like that. It begins to, yeah, make a double cheese. Yeah, yeah. Make it quick. I haven't eaten for days. What's taking it so long in there? Come on. See, you don't, you don't get a drive-through breakthrough. You've got to go through. I said you've got to go through if you're going to get a breakthrough. And see what God has to do to us. Come on over here, brother. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. See so what God has to do to us. Get down there. Get down, get down, get down. God's got to take us, and he's got to come. Just like this, man. you got to get up. Shake, shake. Oh, oh, look at this. That stuff would have never come out the way you were. You ain't going to get a drive-through breakthrough. You're going to have to go through it. You're going to have to go through it, and you're going to have to say, my God, get rid of the flesh. Strip the stinking flesh stinks. It stinks. One of the great evangelists of times, he, he was, who was he? Um, John somebody. Who? Billy Sunday, Billy Sunday. I thought it was John, but Billy Sunday. He was ministering under this big, big tent. There was a huge pole under the center of the tent. You know how he started his service? He climbed up that pole, looked down at the audience. He said, I smell flesh. It stinks in here. That's all he said he had revival. People dropped to their knees. But we'll never be able to bring our kids to that place if we've never been there. I preach it everywhere I go. It's better to prepare than repair. So much of what we're doing in our churches is repairing. Think of all the programs that you've got in your churches. There are a bunch of repair programs. Basically, basically geared for adults. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, okay? I believe in ministering to hurting people. I believe that you have to have programs and things and, and staffing for hurting people. But I'm not talking today to you about repairing. I'm talking about preparing. See, we have got to prepare our life so we can prepare the lives of these children for life. We have got to take these children and mold them and shape them and train them and admonish them in the things of the Spirit. I believe it's better to go fishing with your son 
today than it is to go fishing for him tomorrow. And just as, just as a child led Samson to his greatest victory before the end, so it will be that the church of Jesus Christ, the children, is going to lead the church to his greatest victory before the end. But see, what God is looking for, he's looking for a champion men. Men, stand up. Champion men. Champions! And he's looking for some women. Women, stand up. Yeah! That will say, you can count on me, God. You can count on me to train these children. Go ahead and sit on down. But you realize what I'm saying. Before we can do that, there's got to be a change in us, folks. North Carolina. Fellow right down here. Cheers. You, you will enjoy that book. Glory to God. See, young boys become young men by men who care about young boys. There's a young fellow right there looking at me. Would you stand up? Yeah, you just turn your head. Stand up. Yeah, yeah, you. What's your name? What is it? Lacey? You know what I say to you, young man? Don't wait to be a great man. Be a great boy. Wait a minute. Lacey, stand back up. You want to be a great man, don't you? Then be a great boy. Great boys don't become great men unless they start at your age. Did I say that right? You will become a great man. Why? Because you're a great boy. But see, God is looking, thank you, Lacey. God is looking for men and women that will train this generation of children and teenagers, but we ain't gonna do it the way we look. We ain't gonna do it the way we act. We're, 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 how many know what I'm talking about? They don't have to spend 24 hours in your home. They see you in church. And we've got young people and children that say, man, who do I follow? Who do I model, model my life after? They're trying to find some people in the church, in the house of God. But in order for that to happen, folks, there's going to have to be some shaking. There's going to have to be some shaking in the house. There's going to have to be some cleaning. Judgment begins in the house of God. My brother, you okay? <laughs> Did you get all your money back? Yeah. But see, what, you know what God does? When he takes us and turns us upside down and begins to shake us, and we see all that junk, you know what we need to do? You know what some of us, we, we want to... We want to pick it back up and say, oh, that's valuable. <laughs> that's, that's part of my life. Oh, I spent many years earning this pride. I spent many years earning this dignity. Listen, we sang about it this morning. You got to lose your dignity in order to gain deity. I mean, it's, you know, there's only one reason for a cross. What is it? Death. And there's two crosses that are found in the Bible. The one Jesus died on and the one you and I have to die on. Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. I am dead. I'm a, I'm a dead man. Nevertheless, I live. That's what he said in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your what? Bodies. A what? A living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. A living dead man, a living dead man, a living dead man. What is a sacrifice? It's dead. It's dead. Someone said last night, you know, the altar is not a place of blessing. The altar is a place of sacrifice. But my Bible said, except a seed be planted into the ground and what? Die. It abideth alone. But if it dies, it brings forth what? Life and fruit. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we want? We want more fruit. Fruit that abounds, fruit that remains. And I love it when I, when I travel around the country and I see kids that we've had in our children's church that used to be this high, this little, that are now up here. I mean, I'll never forget the time we ministered in Ohio, Lorraine, Ohio. My wife and I were there and ministered on a Sunday morning, Sunday evening service. And after the Sunday morning service, 
This big man came up to me. I mean, probably 6'4", six, 6'5", six, looked down at me. He says, Pastor John, remember me? And I looked up at him. I says, uh, no. He says, my name, my name is Jason Syrock. I used to help you when I was six years old in the puppets. I said, Jason! He's now almost 30 years old, married, has a wife, two kids, and pastoring a church outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah! 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 Woo! My fruit's remaining, brother. But you've got to stay in it long enough to see the fruit. Some of you haven't been in it long enough. And you're getting weary and well-doing because you ain't seen no fruit. Well, fruit doesn't happen in one day. Hello, lightning brain. It doesn't happen in one day. It takes time. But you got to stick with it. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that you're what? Labor. And can I add to that, please? The labor in the spirit is not in vain. God is not unrighteous and unfaithful to forget your work and your labor of love. Your work and labor. I, I said, what is the difference between work and labor? In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. The, the difference between work and labor. Work is... The definition of work is toil. The def toil, toil. The definition of labor, and I believe that God put, a, put that word labor specifically in there for children's workers. Because this is the definition of it. Labor resulting in weariness. How many feel that on Sunday afternoon? It's Labor resulting in weariness. I say to children's workers, hey, if you're, not, if you're not physically exhausted by the time you get finished ministering to kids, you ain't done a good job. Get back there and do it again. Every one of us, I mean, we've got to be ministering to those kids as if they're, your big toe was stuck in this electrical outlet. <laughs> do you feel like it? No. But you got one shot at this, sir. You got one shot at this, man, and you better give it all you got. But you're not going to give it all you got if there's nothing in there. See, I did that for years, always ministering from the bottom of the barrel. Oh, my God, I have a sermon I got to preach tomorrow morning. Oh, God, I hope there's going to be some kind of anointing on it. And I'm digging. Saturday night, sound familiar? Oh, God, I'm going to teach the kids tomorrow. Until God took me and, ready, ready, big hands. Turned me upside down, and he shook me. He said, son, you got a bunch of flesh there, and it stinks. He said, don't you ever get behind the pulpit again unless you're ministering from the overflow. And I say to you, saints of God, don't you ever, don't you ever get behind your pulpit, your platform, ministering to those children unless you're ministering from the overflow. You say, Brother John, how do I get the overflow? Very simply, what you get in the presence of God on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And so what the kids get on Sunday is called the overflow. See, God never intended for us to do his will without his presence. He never intended for us to do his will without his anointing. And you only get the anointing of God when you're close enough to him where he can rub it in. That's what the word anointing means. Thou anointest my head with oil. See, you can't, you can't get the oil rubbed on you. If, if God is up here and you're back there, he's saying, come. Well, just rub it on me, God. Just rub it on. Son, come into my presence. See, it's when you get into his presence and you get in his face, he takes his anointing oil and rubs it all over, all over. Now you're anointed for service. Why? Because you spent time in his presence. We've got children. Oh, my. We've got children all over this world that are looking for men and for women like you and I that are willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of those kids. 
We take children all over the world. I mean, we have seen miracle after miracle after miracle. And we've seen blind eyes open. We've seen, I mean, literally, when we went, a nine-year-old boy, I mean, Yankee, give me some resistance there, man. I mean, we saw, I, was, I saw one boy you know, yanking a lady out of a wheelchair like this, and I said, my God, one of our workers get over there, he's going to hurt this lady. I mean, 10 seconds later, she's up out of the wheelchair, she's walking. We went to the, we went to the Indian reservation the first time we went. This will be our fourth time. Brother Michael, where are you? Is it four, three or four times? This will be our fourth time. Yeah, the first time we went, we were asked to go visit an elderly lady in the hospital. You know how old she was? She was 44. You know why? Because the average, the average life expectancy on this reservation is 40 years of age. They live on $90 a month from the U.S. government. She was in the hospital, and they were going to cut off her leg, amputate her right leg. It was full of gangrene. We had a little nine-year-old girl from Tulsa, Oklahoma, that laid her little nine-year-old hands on that lady's leg and prayed a little nine-year-old prayer. Dear Jesus, would you please heal her leg? A year, back, a year later, we went back with another team. Guess what? That lady was completely healed. She fixed all the team's meals. <clears throat> little four-year-old girl in Connecticut. She's now a five-year-old girl. A five-year-old. You know what the church calls her? The intercessor. Whenever there's a problem in the church, guess who they call? This little five-year-old girl. She hangs up the phone. She goes in her bedroom. She closes the door behind her, and she begins to intercede and pray until God shows up. The girl, that the demon-possessed girl on another Indian reservation. I got finished ministry, and I used to work for Dr. Summerall. I, don't know how to, I know how to cast out devils. I don't pray them out. I cast them out. And we teach our kids the same thing. You don't play around with devils. You cast them out. You use the authority that you have in the name of Jesus. A lady comes up to me. She says, you know, Pastor John, there's a girl back there. We've been trying to get her underneath the tent all night long. She's full of devils. I got down off the platform, went down the center aisle, made her right. I was almost within arm's reach of this girl. When the Spirit of God says, don't you cast those devils out, let the girls cast them out. So I turned around, I turned around, grabbed three girls, I said, girls, cast the devils out of her. 14 years old. They backed her right up into a pickup truck out in the parking lot. Meanwhile, she's foaming at the mouth. She's, I'm not coming out, I'm not coming out. Those girls, those, those girls that we trained how to cast out devils, I mean, in the name of Jesus, they cast those devils out. I remember the time, the, one of the first times we went to Mexico, there was a seven-year-old boy. The mama brought the seven-year-old boy down to the center of the tent, brought her down to me with tears running down her face. She says, would you please pray for my son? He can't walk, seven years old. Well, I was about ready to reach down and grab his legs and pray for him, but the kids beat me to it. I mean, they gathered around, laid their hands on those legs. I mean, that boy walked out of that tent totally healed. I remember the time where a lady came in underneath the tent. She could lift up her left arm and she could praise God, but her right arm was all deformed like this in her fingers. We had one of our boys lay his hands on this lady's arm, begin to pray. He said it scared him as he was praying because as a 12-year-old boy, all of a sudden he's looking and he feels, he's, he feels the bones begin to crack and the fingers begin to straighten out. And for the first time, she was able to lift up her right arm. We were in Houston, Texas a couple years ago. Richard Chikari, the president of Full Gospel Businessmen, he called us, he says, would you come and would you minister to all our kids? We're expecting 7,000 people from all over the world to come to our convention here in Houston at the Hyatt Regency. Yes, sir, I will. So we took a team of people. Tuesday afternoon, our first service was Tuesday night. Tuesday afternoon, a little eight, seven-year-old boy comes, 11-year-old boy comes up to me. He says, are you Pastor John? I said, yes, I am. And he says, my name is Evangelist Pedro. And he shakes my hand, pulls out a business card, look at it, and it says, Evangelist Pedro from Miami, Florida. And I begin, Evangelist Pedro, 11 years old, how cute. Then I found out that Richard Carrion flew this boy in from Miami, Florida, to be their Thursday morning guest speaker to all the businessmen. The same boy, the same boy is on radio, and he's on radio teaching the gospel in Central and South America every weekend, ministering to adults. When I found that out, I said, forget this, man. I'm not preaching. Get up there, Pedro. You're preaching. Man, he went through 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. I was in awe. I took three pages of notes. My wife was sitting next to me. She said, wow. We've been in camps. We've been in camps. By the way, if you want more information on camps that we have, we've got it in the back table there. But I remember the camp, one, one camp. We have this happening all the time, but it was like a, a Holy Ghost line. This, this didn't, just didn't take place when 
the, the laughter thing was coming out. This took place seven, eight years ago, folks. I mean, in this side of the chapel, kids were laughing hysterically. You crossed that Holy Ghost line, and they were interceding and crying and weeping. Those that were weeping crossed that Holy Ghost line, and they were instantly laughing. Those that were laughing, they crossed that Holy Ghost line, and they were instantly weeping and crying and interceding in the spirit. We had to carry half those kids back to the dorms at 1230 at night. They, I mean, they were in the presence of God. Are we seeing the fruit? You better believe it. We just got a call from one of our fruits. He's now 21 years old, has cut two CDs. He travels with us during the summer. Well, you know, Jason, Jason Stewart, just cut a second CD. But you know, Jason at one time when he was a little boy in children's church, he didn't have any friends. You know why? He was fat. He was a huge boy. He was fat. And he couldn't talk. He would dig, 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 dig. He couldn't even say his name. He shares the testimony. When the phone rings, man, when he used, the phone used to ring, he would run from the phone. That's unusual for kids because most kids run to the phone. Because he wouldn't want to answer the phone because he gets so embarrassed he couldn't even say his name. But my wife would take him. Not just on Sunday morning, but she'd call him throughout the week and confess God's word into him. And now he'll talk your ears off. Second year student at Oral Roberts University traveled to 36 countries around the world. I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, listen, God has some great things in store for your kids. First of all, you got to take the blinders off of yourself. Ooh, thank you, Lord Jesus. How about God putting some spit? on your eyes how about God spitting into your eyes because maybe maybe just maybe you're not seeing too clearly right now maybe it's maybe it's one of these things I I think I see men but they're like tr trees walking why don't you rub your eyes just a little again oh come on come on rub them rub them rub them now I said rub them rub them rub those eyes okay open them up again because just as God Ooh, you see what God is going to do, ladies and gentlemen? You're going to begin to see better with your spiritual eyes than with your natural eyes. You're going to begin to see things in the spirit you've never seen before. You're going to look at little Johnny, little Susie, little Mary in a different way when you get back home. You're not going to see a troublemaker. You're not going to see a boy that's just come from a divorce situation. You're not going to see another boy that can't keep, that gets C's, D's, and F's in school. You're going to see them in a little bit different way. And I close with this illustration. I grew up in Buffalo, New York, in a government housing project. When I was three years of age, my mom and dad divorced. I didn't have a daddy. Well, later on, I had a stepdad. But I was, my, it was my sisters and myself living in Glenny, uh, Glenny Apartments, Glenny Projects there in Buffalo. I loved going to church. My, my, my mom would uh, work six days a week, sometimes 10 to 12 hours a day. And in my spare time, which I had a lot of as a kid, I'd either be out in the playground or I'd be in church. You know why I loved going to church as a little boy? because there was a man that loved me. His name was Mr. Ray, Mr. Ray Milholland. And I loved going to church because, you know, they tried to keep me out. They tried to keep me, me out, but I, I managed to get into church every time. See, those doors were that thick, 12 foot high, solid wood, handle way up there. I'm just a little squirt, you know, six, seven, eight years old. I remember reaching up, grab that handle, that door. And I knew if I could just get this left elbow inside the crack of that door, if I could open up that big door just enough, I'd be able to get in church. They tried to keep me out, but I got in every time because I was able to get the skinny little body and I was able to push that door open. And when I walked into the church lobby, there he was, Mr. Ray. Every time I went to church, there was Mr. Ray. And he loved me. I was his favorite kid in the entire church. At least he made me feel that way. You know, he'd reach down and he'd take me and he hugged me and spin me around and hold me real close. He said, Johnny, it's so good to see you again. 
he put me down and he reached in his pocket, pull out a piece of candy. He says, now, Donnie, here's a piece of candy. Now, raise your right hand, those of you that have been with me. <laughs> raise your right hand and say, uh, repeat after me, I promise I will not eat my candy in church. And I put my hand down. I says, thank you, Mr. Ray, so much for the candy. See, those, those of you that have traveled with me, you know that's where I learned it. But see, Mr. Ray would call me throughout the week. Mr. Ray loved me. He'd call me and say, Johnny, how you doing? How's school? You have a test? Do I need to pray for you for it? How are your sisters doing? Your mom doing okay? Hey, Johnny, would you like to get a hamburg? Yeah! I want a hamburg! Yeah! Want an ice cream? Yes! We lived on the third floor of that apartment complex. And when, when I knew that Mr. Ray was coming, his wife and him were coming, I made sure all my buddies were knew that I was going to go with Mr. Ray. And see, he got a brand new Cadillac every year, a Cadillac, a big tank of a car. But it wasn't just an ordinary Cadillac. It was a convertible Cadillac. And his wife would let me sit in the front seat, and she would sit in the back seat. And I remember the feeling that I had going down Kensington Avenue, Bailey Avenue, Brighter Street. The feeling that I had with that top down. And man, I felt like a million bucks. He made me feel like the most special child in the entire world. Mr. Ray loved me. As a little boy growing up in a government housing project that did not have a daddy. I was fatherless. But I really wasn't because I had Mr. Ray. He loved me. And I loved him. I saw something in that man that I wanted. I saw something in Mr. Ray that I wanted to be like. I want to be like Mr. Ray. And see, he used to fix his hair. He had this head of hair. And at one time I did too. But he used to triple-decker his hair. You know, it had a wave here, then it had another one, and then it had another one. And it always amazed me when I saw him because everything was just so perfect. And I remember I would spend literally, not hours, but a long, long time in front of the mirror on Sunday morning trying to get my hair looking like Mr. Ray's. I not only wanted to look like him, but I wanted to be him. I wanted to be like him. Now, did Mr. Ray know that this little boy, Johnny, that grew, in a government, grew, grew up in a government housing project that did not have a daddy, did he know that little Johnny was going to grow up one day to become a man, to take missions trips all over the world, to start a Bible training school? Did Mr. Ray know that we would have a summer intern program, that we'd be training children and young people from all over the nation to do the work of the ministry? Did he know that little Johnny would be would be here teaching you? No. But I want to tell you something. I'm here ministering to you today because of one man by the name of Mr. Ray. Plain and simple. I'm here today because of one man. Who knows where this guy would be if it wasn't for a Mr. Ray. Who knows the children that you know where they would be if it wasn't for you? Oh, I'm just a little peon. No, you're not. Well, I'm just a glorified babel. No, you're not. Get that stinking thinking. My God, do you realize who you are? You are servants of the Most High God. You are, serv you are the cream of the crop. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. He's anointed you to touch and affect the lives of sons and daughters all over the world. Where is your world? Your world right now might be in your classroom. Your world right now might be in your neighborhood. But do you realize who you're affecting? Who you're reaching? Would you stand to your feet, please? My God, my God. You know, when I get to heaven, I've got certain things that I want to do right away. And one of the things I've told Jesus that I want to do 
Jesus? Where is Mr. Ray? Where is he, Jesus? And I wouldn't be surprised if he's standing right next to Jesus when I get there. Because that's the way he was when I was a little boy. He was always standing right there with Jesus right next to him. But when I get to heaven, I'm going to say, where is he, Jesus? Because before he can put his arms around me, I'm going to put my arms around him. And I'm going to say, Mr. Ray, thank you for giving to the Lord. Because you loved a little boy by the name of Johnny that grew up in a government housing project. Because you loved me, Mr. Ray, when I was a little boy, a fatherless little boy, I'm here today. And by the way, Mr. Ray, not only am I here, but I have brought thousands of other people because of you! And I believe, sir and ma'am, you're going to be able to do the same thing. You're going to usher in not just a handful, but you're going to usher in hundreds and thousands of people that you have touched. Maybe you've just got five in your classroom, but you might just have that one that might go to the nations of the world. Lift up your hands toward heaven. You see, our children need more. I love what Tommy Tinney said a couple weeks ago. He says, our children need more than information. They need impartation. And do you know what? We need the same thing. We need more than information. We need impartation. This conference is more impartation than it is information, as, as you probably have discovered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's impartation. Impartation. But before God can impart, he's got to, he's got to turn you upside down, and he's got to do some shaking. He's got to do some shaking to get rid of the flesh, the stinking flesh that we hang on to, the busyness of life, my God. My God, right now, let the Spirit of God fall fresh on your people. Let there be a fresh impartation from the Spirit of the Lord. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on this group right now. Fall fresh on this section right over here. Fall fresh right now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on this center section right now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I thank you, Lord, for spitting in their eyes so they can see, see into the spirit realm like they've never seen before so they can begin to see clearly, Lord. My God, you have taken us by the hand and you've led us out of town so we can get a touch from you. Father, we are not leaving this place without an impartation of the Spirit of God. This section right over here, lift up your hands toward heaven. Let the Spirit of God fall fresh on you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Those of you that are up on the balcony, lift up your hands toward heaven. Let the Spirit of God fall in this place. All over this place, let's just begin to praise Him. 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 Let the Spirit of God rub, rub, rub his anointing in your eyes so that you can see, so that you can see clearly what the Spirit of God wants to do. So you can see clearly what the Spirit of God wants to say. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh. Fall fresh on us. Oh, Father, we see the children the way you see them. We see them the way you see them. We see them the way you see them. My God, I thank you, Lord, for doing such an awesome work in every man and woman in this house that we will not leave this place the way we came. No, we won't. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus, Spirit of God, Spirit of God. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on, more, 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 more! 
I know this isn't an evening service, but I do welcome you down here in the altars. I do welcome you down here at the altars. We'll see what God wants to do. Come on, come on. The altar is not a place of blessing, but the altar is a place of sacrifice. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, huh. there can't be a resurrection until there's first a death. There can't be a resurrection until there's first a death. Die. 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 There can't be a resurrection, ladies and gentlemen, until there is first a death. A death. Except a seed fall into the ground and die. It abideth alone, but if it's planted and it dies, it shall bear fruit, fruit, fruit that remains. Father, I pray for every person. Lord, that you get rid of the stinking thinking that we've been walking in. The busyness, oh, the hecticness of life. My God, and doing this and doing that and doing this and doing that. Oh, Lord, God, that you would help us to prioritize our time, get our schedule to where we will always put you first. You want to break through, go through, go through, go through, go through. Push yourself through. Go, 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 go. Push yourself through. The spirit of will is willing, but the flesh is weak. But you don't let the flesh dominate your life. You say, flesh, haha, <laughs> flesh, die. Spirit of God, rise up within me. Spirit of God, take control. Spirit of God, you are in control. I said, just let the Spirit of God do what He wants to do for the next few minutes. Come on. Come on. We've got exactly 12 hours and 15 minutes to make this day better than yesterday. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Father, I thank you, Lord, for showing, showing your people exactly what their next step is. Oh, ye see that the eyes of their understanding being enlightened. Ye see la that the eyes of their understanding are enlightened. Their eyes of their understanding are being enlightened right now, Father. Sili di laboro so ronde bikia se le bikia se le biki. Cru ronde bikia se tikira se lo toro so. Cool, Lord Jesus.